earthquake tragedy. More than 120 are dead, many more are missing. Shallow but strong, the tremors shattered mountain villages, raising one to the ground. Fingertip searches continue as the Pope offers prayers and the Prime Minister says no one and nowhere will be forgotten. Also tonight, a mystery as three men die in one afternoon in the waters of Camber Sands. MPs demand action on soaps and shower gels endangering the world's fish stocks. And the world's biggest airship, Belly Flops, on only its second flight. This is the ITV Evening News with Alistair Stewart and Charlene White. Good evening. In the dead of night, beneath Italy's central mountain range, vast rock formations snapped. In the resulting earthquake, buildings cracked, villages crumbled and people deep in sleep died. More than 120 of them already, but that is expected to rise. Still more are missing, with nightfall about to hamper rescue efforts. The epicentre of the 6.2 magnitude quake was close to the towns of Akumuli and Amatrice, where many had gathered ahead of a festival. The tremors woke people miles away in Rome and could even be felt even further away in Switzerland and Croatia. Our correspondent Emma Murphy is in Amatrice tonight and has sent this report. This time yesterday, these buildings were busy family homes. Tonight, they're in ruins, as is most of this town. Beneath the rubble, many of those who lived here. Some still alive, many others lost. On the few walls still standing, the reminders of how normal life can go so dreadfully wrong. The clock with nothing left to rest on, the keys in the door which now leads nowhere, the abandoned sofa and chair. There is now a huge rescue and recovery operation underway. Local people and those trained in this challenging business working together. It's uh, rather bad. It's not much left of the city. There's a lot of buildings collapsed. There probably is going to be still a lot of people under the, uh, under the bricks. It's very difficult to get to because they're old buildings. So everything just fold uh, like a cart house. It collapsed. There are people, unfortunately, deceased people that we had to take out. In the centre of Amatrice, the clock tower shows exactly the time the 6.2 magnitude earthquake struck. The damage was done because it was only shallow and there was a spate of aftershocks, one reaching a magnitude of 5.5. Some survivors have been found. This man pulled to safety exactly 12 hours after being encased in his home. What strikes you most of all as soon as you arrive on this street is how close the line is between life and death. Rooms where people would have stood a chance of surviving so close to rooms where they would have stood no chance at all. Those who were able to get out in time have today been trying to recover a few items from their homes. A sorry stream of small bags and cases being hauled away as the rescue workers who have descended on this mountain too. I thank God I survived, this man says. But there were so many young people here. It's holiday season and the town fair was the day after tomorrow. So many people had come for that. It was a similar picture of devastation in the Umbrian town of Akumli. Several hours after the last aftershocks, rescue teams were still searching for families missing beneath the rubble. From the air, it's possible to trace the route of the tremor and pick out the dreadful damage it has done. Italians know their country stands on a fault line, but knowledge does not ease their shock and grief. Well, Italy borders where the African and Eurasian plates meet and is one of Europe's most active fault lines. The main one runs along the mountainous spine of the country and has been responsible for many deaths over the past 100 years. In 2009, almost 300 people died after a powerful earthquake devastated the 13th century city of Lakia in the Abruzzo area, not far from Amatrice. In October 2002, 27 children at a Halloween party in San Giuliano di Puglia were killed when a building collapsed during another quake. And one of the most deadly to date was in 1915, near the town of Avazzano, when 30,000 people were killed. 
Oh, we can return now live to Emma Murphy, who is in Amatrice for us tonight. That desperate search for survivors, Emma, continuing. Indeed so, and in the last few minutes they've just been bringing in more rescue workers and more dogs that are going to search through the, the rubble in the hope of finding people alive. There was a really desperately sad moment um, an hour or so ago when rescue workers actually asked for quiet around one of the houses that they'd been working on. And then in the quiet, you could hear the ringing of a phone. And it turned out that they'd asked the relative of one of those people who was thought to be inside the house to call their phone in the hope it would give them a better indication of where that person was. Unfortunately, the phone call went unanswered. We are also told that tomorrow they may slightly change the way that they're carrying out this rescue work. They may start to bring in the rather more heavy lifting gear. At the moment, they're desperately hoping to preserve any life that is within the rubble, and they're trying to do it by hand or with particularly small um, pieces of machinery. Emma, thank you. Here, three men have died after being pulled from the sea at Campesan's beauty spot in East Sussex. It happened this afternoon as thousands of people were there enjoying the hottest day of the year so far. Well, Derek Johnson is at the scene for us. Derek, this is such a terrible tragedy. Have the police said anything? Well, the police uh, tonight are saying that indeed this was a terribly tragic situation and that the people who were on the beach at the time were traumatised by what happened. As you can see, the beach is still open. Many people are on the beach as well tonight, even after what happened earlier at about... 10 past 2, the emergency services were contacted with news that a man was in trouble out to sea. Uh, everybody came here, Coast Guard, RNLI, ambulance, and over the course of about half an hour, it became clear that another two men were in trouble as well. They were rescued and brought to the shore. An eyewitness told us that they were there for a good two hours. CPR was administered, but sadly, it was determined that they had died. The police then went and asked people if their men had belongings so they could establish their identity and we're not clear now uh, that the police do know who they are. Unfortunately, it is beautiful here, but a spot tinged with tragedy. A month ago, a 19-year-old Brazilian boy also died Got in, getting into trouble out to sea and since then a petition has been uh, got up. About 2,000 people have signed it asking for a life guard to be stationed here permanently tonight though as you see people still enjoying the fine weather but another tragic reminder of how dangerous the sea is even on a beautiful day Derek thank you a two-year-old girl who was swept out to sea with her family in Cornwall last week has died in hospital Michaela Brown Ice's father Rudy was also killed when the family of five was caught by a 13-foot wave while on the beach in Newquay the family of a 21-year-old British woman who was stabbed to death in Australia have paid tribute to her, saying she was an amazing young woman with an adventurous spirit. Maya Acliff chung who's from Derbyshire, was attacked at a backpackers' hostel in Queensland. Her attacker, a French national, is said to have shouted Allah Akbar as he killed her. From Derbyshire, Ben Chapman reports. She was, say friends, a free spirit who was living her dream to travel the world. But last night, Mia Alif Chung was stabbed to death just days into the latest leg of her year-long adventure. Tonight, back in Derbyshire, her mother's partner told me she possessed rare qualities. Rose's beloved daughter Mia was an amazing young woman with an adventurous spirit. Not only... Was she kind and funny? She was clever, sassy, with a sense of fun. Mia was full of the kind of open-minded compassion for life that you don't see that often. Mia was killed at a popular hostel for fruit pickers in Queensland in front of 30 other backpackers. Police say they're looking at a number of possible motives for the attack, including terrorism. Initial inquiries indicate that comments may be construed of an extremist nature were made by the alleged offender. It is alleged that the suspect used the phrase Allah Akbar during the attack and when arrested by police. A British man, Tom Jackson, was also critically injured after reportedly trying to save Mia. Australian police say the alleged attacker was on a temporary visa and they're investigating whether mental health or drugs problems were involved. 
Just days before her death, Mia had posted on social media tales from her trip about the wildlife and her tan. Her family say she died living life to the full. Ben Chapman, ITV News, Derbyshire. There was a fresh twist today in the extraordinary row over Jeremy Corbyn's train trip to Newcastle. The Information Commissioner launched a probe into whether Virgin Trains breached data protection laws by publishing CCTV pictures of the Labour leader on board. Mr Corbyn reacted angrily to further questions over the incident today. And there were awkward questions too for leadership challenger Owen Smith, as Angus Walker explains. A few empty seats at Jeremy Corbyn's press conference today. The row over whether he had to sit on the floor on a train or not chugs on. Yes, I did walk through the train. Yes, I did look for two empty seats together so I could sit down with my wife to talk to her. That wasn't possible. The Information Commissioner is now looking at this footage released by Virgin Trains on Richard Branson's Twitter account as a possible breach of data protection laws. It appears to show Jeremy Corbyn walking past available seats before he was filmed sitting on the floor to highlight his campaign to re-nationalise the railways. So Jeremy Corbyn versus Virgin boss Richard Branson, two men with little in common other than a beard and very different views on how to run the railways. Well, I'm very pleased that Richard Branson has been able to break off from his holiday to take this issue seriously with the importance it obviously deserves. I hope he's very well aware of our policy, which is that um, train operating companies should become part of the public realm, not the private sector. Owen Smith's attempt to unseat Jeremy Corbyn also veered off the rails after he appeared to suggest during a campaign event that Jeremy Corbyn was a, quote, lunatic. And what you want to from me is some, you know, lunatic at the top of the Labour Party. I didn't use that language with reference to Jeremy. I used it with reference to myself. Somebody who said I've been running around like a lunatic. If anybody's been offended by that, I apologise unreservedly. Another week, another apology from Owen Smith. Last month, he was urging Labour to attack Theresa May, saying he wanted to smash her back on her heels. He was forced to clarify that he wasn't advocating actual violence. A week ago, he was forced to explain a statement after appearing to suggest Britain should negotiate with so-called Islamic State. <laughs> so amid the clamour for votes, it's all the chatter around the campaign, drowning out both leadership candidates as they try to get their main messages heard. So exactly a month until the winner of the Labour leadership contest is due to be announced. Incredibly distracting, both candidates trying to cut through the noise. Jeremy Corbyn wanted to talk about the NHS today. Owen Smith wanted to talk about Brexit. So they are struggling as they continue to campaign to occupy the leader's seat on the Labour benches in the place behind me. Angus, thank you. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, how High Street Cosmetics could be hurting the fish in our seas. And the new planets that could harbour life in a galaxy not so far away. Those stories and more after this very short break. Welcome back. MPs have called for a ban on cosmetics that contain microbeads over concerns of the damage they're doing to our oceans. The tiny plastic particles, often smaller than a millimetre, are put into products like face scrubs and body soaps, which millions of us use every day. Around 100,000 microbeads can be released when a person takes just a single shower. But campaigners say they can be ingested by more than 280 marine species. Well, they're being voluntarily phased out in the UK, but MPs say it isn't happening fast enough. Our consumer editor, Chris Troy, spent the day with marine experts in Southampton to see the dangers they pose. I'm just leaving the Empress. Today, I joined this marine research vessel to find out more about the new pollution warning. The source of the problem, tiny plastic microbeads, is close to home for millions of consumers. And these things, here we see some, these are, these are quite coarse ones. These things are in lots of cleaning products, they're in toothpaste, and of course the cosmetics we're hearing so much about. 
Well, the sorts of creatures that are absorbing these things are things like shellfish, so things like oysters, mussels, that sort of thing, but also things like prawns. Firms put them in many everyday products to improve cleansing and exfoliation, but once in the sea, the plastic beads can absorb toxins, harming aquatic life. Today, MP said 680 tonnes of these microbeads are used in the UK every year. And I'm here to find out just how widespread they are in our seas. This collection tube gathers seawater to be checked under a microscope for tiny plastic beads. Straight away we can see a couple of microbeads there, there's another one down here, there's one up here. It tells us that these are quite widespread across our oceans uh, and so we do need to think about how we tackle this problem. We spoke to leading manufacturers and here's what they told us. The makers of Clearasil, Reckitt Benckiser, say they'll remove polyethylene microbeads from all their products by the end of 2017. The makers of Garnier Skin Active, L'Oreal, told us they're working to reformulate all products that contain microbeads. Manufacturers of this Neutrogena Daily Scrub, Johnson & Johnson, say they'll remove microbeads by the end of 2017 and have already reformulated half of their affected products, including this one. Isn't this an example of where voluntary action is already working? We don't need new laws. Unfortunately, their commitments on microbeads are just all over the place. You know, some of them um, have differing timelines for bringing in bans. They define microbeads differently. Some of them only apply to certain products, not others. The industry aims to remove all microbeads within four years, as products we use to clean ourselves have had the very opposite effect on our seas. Chris Choi, ITV News on Southampton Water. A Royal Marine is being held by police on suspicion of preparing for acts of Northern Ireland-related terrorism. The 30-year-old was arrested in Somerset this morning. A house in Exminster in Devon and nearby Wooded Area are being searched. Well, Rupert Evelyn is in Exminster live for us tonight. Rupert, what lies behind this arrest? Well, while the arrest and the searches in this investigation are concentrated uh, on the southwest of England, in, in Devon and in Somerset, uh, it actually is also heavily focused on Northern Ireland, where today police uh, were searching some properties. It relates also to the discovery of an arms cache uh, earlier this year. Uh, in that part of the world, near to Larn, in which an armour-piercing improvised rocket was found, anti-personnel mines, several pipe bombs and magazines, uh, and ammunition as well. So clearly a very serious terrorism-related investigation, which is why police here uh, in Devon today have been keen to try and reassure the community. The man, who is a serving member of the British Armed Forces, was arrested at an address in Somerset and has been taken to a Somerset police station. The public can be reassured that there is no intelligence to suggest an immediate threat to our communities. Well, the Ministry of Defence said today that obviously they were aware of the arrest of a serving member of the armed forces, but they added it would be inappropriate to comment further uh, in light of an ongoing investigation. Rupert, thank you. The search for life somewhere out there is focusing on our sun's next door neighbour. Astronomers have discovered a new Earth-like planet that orbits a star just four, li four light years or <laughs> 25 trillion miles away. But either way, not exactly close, but close enough to be reached by a future space mission. And the British team involved in the discovery are very excited, as Nazanin Mosheri reports. It is a remarkable discovery. The closest known potentially habitable planet to Earth, orbiting Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the Sun, 25 trillion miles away. It is the breakthrough of a lifetime for these researchers at the European Southern Observatory. So we have found a terrestrial planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. It's the nearest exoplanet we will ever found because it's the nearest star to the Sun and we are very excited about it. They found this faraway world with the help of a huge observatory in the Chilean Atacama Desert. The planet is in a habitable zone, the area around a star where water can remain liquid on a planet's surface. Experts call it the Goldilocks zone because the temperature needs to be just right. If a planet orbits too close to its star, it risks a runaway greenhouse gas effect like Venus. But if it's too far away, any surface water will freeze like Mars. 
it's quite an encouraging prospect for the existence of very simple single-celled life, sort of slime not for the prospects of the sort of alien life that we might be able to communicate with. Scientists can't see the planet even through the most powerful of telescopes. What they can do is measure the slightest movement of light, picking up on any changes. Research is already underway into a new generation of tiny nanoprobes with laser-driven sails, which could make the journey in just 20 years. The sun isn't going to last forever and stars have a fixed lifetime uh, and so we eventually will probably want to move to other parts of our own solar system or indeed, indeed beyond. A manned mission to the planet is impossible with current technology. It would take 80,000 years, about as long as humans have existed on Earth. Nazni Mashiri, ITV News, Milton Keynes. And finally, a rather embarrassing demonstration today of the old adage, what goes up must come down, starring the world's largest aircraft on only its second flight. Yes, the Airlander 10 did what can best be described as a <laughs> belly flop as it tried to land at an airfield in Bedfordshire. So Jalkaria takes up the story. As bystanders watched on, the airship, famous for its bulbous rear end, nosedived into the airfield. Oh, my God, he's actually just broken. Perhaps one of the slowest air crashes to be witnessed, as it hit the airfield, the cockpit took the brunt of the impact. Look carefully, and you can see one of the pilots dangling off the end, trying to steady the craft. Moments later, the ship appears to land on him, but there's relief from witnesses when they see he's OK. The pilots are OK. There's movement in there. Ground crews were quick on the scene, soon trying to fix the damage. The company behind Airlander said all crew was safe and well. Since the revamp, the world's largest aircraft only took to the skies for its maiden voyage last Thursday. It's back as hope it'll be used not just for military surveillance, but by paying customers too. It was Airlander's second test flight, and judging by today's crash, it still has some way to go. Sejal Karia, ITV News. That's all for now. Tom Bradley will be here with News at 10. But from the whole team here, a very good evening to you. Goodbye.